Do you know what they call alternative medicine that's been proven to work? Medicine. Welcome to the Holistic Healing Collective Podcast, a show about energy healing, holistic, and plant medicine. Our passion is healing on all levels. You'll hear guests from doctors, yoga teachers, energy healers, researchers, coaches, and real people who've recovered from serious debilitating health conditions, getting to the root of the problem and solving it. And this is not medical advice. Welcome to the Holistic Healing Collective Podcast. And now your host, William Dickinson. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Holistic Healing Collective podcast. Today, we have a guest, Chelsea Haynes. She is a gut health coach that helps high-performing women heal their gut so they can trust it again. I can already tell we're going to get on like a house on fire. We've had a little, a little introduction to each other, and we're so, we're vibing on the same levels. It's, it's great. So this is going to be a, a very interesting episode, I'm sure. Could you tell us, first of all, I, I always like to ask this of, of all of my guests. How did you get into this, Chelsea? Yes, Billy, and thank you so much for having me. I, I'm really feeling the vibes. I'm super excited about this conversation. So thank you so much. And you know, how did I get into this? I'm sure. I'm sure it's some type of uh, version of most of your guests. And I always like to say, you know, self self healing is a forever journey. And for those of us who feel super called to it, we end up um, feeling called to help others do the same. So for me, of course, it was a very personal journey that started with. Uh, childhood trauma that eventually manifested as autoimmune disease by way of perfectionism and overproductivity in high school and, and trying to, you know, be the straight A student and the captain of all the teams and just being quote unquote perfect on paper so that maybe then at that point I would feel safe, loved and accepted enough for, um, well, all the things that I felt like I was missing in my life at the time, which, um, you know, it, it, it involved childhood abandonment. My father left. My mom had to file bankruptcy. We lost our home. We were potentially homeless for a little while. It was real wild. Luckily, an angel dropped into our life and we um, were never actually on the streets. Uh, but it, it was really to, to a very close point there. So I actually found a, a journal recently under my childhood bed. Um, that's now a guest bedroom. But my mom still has a, key, a box of keepsakes there. And, and I found a journal entry from that time. I was 12 years old. And it's interesting as I've dove into my own healing, I, I realized I don't have a lot of really specific. I have some very specific memories, but I don't have a lot of broad spectrum memories from the age of about 10 to really when I went to college. Wow. And I have a lot of amazing childhood memories. And I, and I learned this has really been a pivotal piece to my healing that abandonment is a real thing. And I remember the first time through a therapist hearing uh, the term abandonment wound and thinking, whoa, that's, that's something I experienced, right? So, so, you know, to kind of wrap it all up in a, in a pretty bow, it's been a long journey of self-healing and self-development. And I feel grateful that by the grace of God, I've been gifted this almost Spidey-like sense of intuition, borderline uh, clairvoyant almost, I would say. Some of my friends, you know, they, they say to me, man, it's, it's just weird when, when you message me and you just know. It's like you just know that something's up. Yeah, I do. That's the weird thing. I do know something's up. <laughs> but that, that um, drive in me to listen to that inner voice has always been really strong. And for me, that's kind of how that's how God speaks to me, or at least that's how I hear God speak to me. And that's really an important piece of the healing pie for me. And after college, my autoimmune disease, which I have psoriasis, which is just a very annoying, it's just an annoying thing. You know, it's, it's unsightly, it's frustrating. And for anyone who deals with skin issues, whether it's acne or eczema or alopecia or, you know, anything that deals with our hair, nails or skin, it's just a very vulnerable mm -hmm. thing because it's essentially wearing our actual emotions on our sleeves. And I love that. Yeah. And after college, I, I was frustrated with dermatologists and 
you know, I started practicing yoga in 2009, and that was kind of my first glimpse into self-reflection. Svadhyaya is one of the eight limbs of yoga, and you don't hear too much about it on the yoga mat. You're primarily practicing pranayama, breathing, or asana, the, the physical poses, but good teachers will guide you to do some self-reflection. And, and I think, you know, over those next four or five years, college, and then the year after, I, I really was... And I, of course, studied psychology because I was fascinated with the human brain, but I wasn't quite at that level where I was, I wasn't able to connect the dots that what I had been experiencing in my life and what I was still living every day was trauma responses mm. to abandonment. I've since been able to learn and realize and heal all those things, which we'll be able to get into. But um, really to wrap it up to the gut situation, I, I just had this really strong instinct that something was happening internally. And I was really frustrated with all of the dermatologists that just kept pushing biologics on me. Now, I always have to disclaim this at this part of the story, because if you have an autoimmune disease and you have opted for biologics to help you get through the symptoms of it, then bless that medicine. Like, bravo for taking that empowered step. It's not an easy choice to make, or for some people, it might be easy for me. It, it, it's, it's been kind of this forever battle. Do I want to go that route? And for me personally, it just was, it just never felt right. So I felt frustrated when I expressed that to my doctors and they were unwilling to listen. And their second solution, well, here's another steroid cream. And of course, as soon as I would stop using the creams, it would, the rashes would come back with a vengeance. And I think as most of us who are on this gut healing self-exploration journey, we, we start with the assumption that we're allergic to food. That's at least for me, I thought I must have a sensitivity to food. This must be something that I'm eating. I must be eating something that's irritating me. Now, of course, there's a lot of value to that. And there's a lot of truth to that because when we are living in such a stressed out and inflammatory state, we are highly reactive to many, many foods. Mm -hmm. So of course there are sensitivity sensitivities that arise, which again, we'll come back to this, but those are not root cause. But that's where I started my personal journey. And for most of the people who are just starting out in gut health, it's where I start my clients on their journey and where a lot of people feel the most comfortable on their journey, um, at least just to create that healing container. And Billy, you mentioned something right before we started recording that there's value to eliminating inflammation for a period of time to, to really have that healing container and to allow your gut sort of to have a reset, to take a yes. deep breath, you know, as there is value in eliminating anything else in your life, whether it's toxic people or toxic habits that are causing pain and suffering in your life. It's the same thing with food. So I hired my first health coach in 2009 and I went on that journey and, and it's been over a decade of exploration and sort of bouncing back and forth, kind of like what you just said of, of, you know, the food, the logistics, but then also really diving deeper into that and looking at different layers of all of that. And that's, that's why I'm here and why I do what I do, because it's been a really long and frustrating journey. And I feel passionate about helping people um, get to the end result where I am now in a much quicker amount of time. <laughs> I, I really love that. It's so relatable to me. It's, it's almost like everything you said, I could have said myself, like it, word for word, it's, 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 it's almost the same, the same tale. And I think that this is, this is true of people that are called into this profession is you have to go to the depths of, of the struggle. You have to really go through it. And then you're in a really blessed position to be able to help other people through it as well. And I think from the sounds of everything that you said, you must, you must be helping a lot of people make some significant changes in their life. Yeah, I feel so grateful that, you know, it's, I think the the entrepreneurial journey is, 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 it's really just become another layer of self-reflection and self-healing. Yes, be. I agree. I really agree. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, you know, for, I think for us self-development junkies and people that are just like really called to elevate ourselves and the frequency of the world around us, it's, everything is an opportunity to learn. And mm -hmm. I feel really grateful that I've been called to entrepreneurship. That was actually my, my minor in college was business entrepreneurship, but I very quickly realized that all of the all of those business plans that I wrote to get A's and in, in my degree, um, none of them have really panned out the way no. that, that it's done today. And, yeah. you know, I've, I feel grateful to be able to connect with people on social media like this because uh, my husband and I live in Panama. We've been nomads for 2000. Oh, since amazing. 2000. Yeah. It's been really cool. So launching a business and really being, in, being able to help people from all over the world has, has been such a blessing. And, I guess what's even cooler about that and, and just to 
wrap that up is, you know, when you, when you see somebody, I think as, as someone who feels called to help other people, we of course always have that tiny little doubt in our mind and something that helps that eventually go away is when you start to see the results in the people that you're helping. And it's mm -hmm. been a few years now and a, and a few hundred people that I've helped through this process and it's, it's, it works. And, and I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a forever ongoing process, but to be able to get to that point where um, you're no longer having to restrict foods and you're not afraid to leave the house because of a bout of IBS, or you actually have a clear brain to be able to run your business or mm -hmm. show up for your family again, it's priceless. Yeah, I really think healing, it does continue forever, but you reach a point where the process of continuing to heal is actually enjoyable. It's like, it's what you live for. It's this really like enriching, enjoyable experience. It's very pleasurable. And it's, I think that having such a severe chronic illness previously helps you have a new layer of gratitude for, for what it is you're experiencing, because you can't really appreciate what you have unless you, you haven't had it. So going through that initial period of not having it and then being able to have it and all its richness is, is really nice. Absolutely. So Something that you mentioned just a minute ago, uh, my, my, my brain laser focused in on it, you said emotional root cause. And I thought, oh, that's an interesting thing. We should, we should talk about that because yeah. the, this is, the, as we said, this is a journey, but I feel like the journey always starts with the root cause. You have to really truly understand where these issues are stemming from. If you ever want to really resolve them or make progress towards this, this, this healing experience. So I think a lot of people are more familiar with like physiological root cause. So chemical exposure, nutritional deficiency, for example, but some are kind of a, a bit unwilling to, to dip the toe in the water of the emotional root cause. So would you feel comfortable sharing a little bit more about your emotional root cause and what people can do to become aware of and explore and actually heal their emotional root cause? Yes, absolutely, Belina. And this is just such perfect timing for this and something that especially in like the wellness world and I put I put quotes up because it's, <laughs> you know it's important because of course there there's always going to be bad people doing bad things and and there's always going to be good people doing good things and I think there's a little bit of both in everybody and there's beauty to that but when it comes to western marketing hitting people's pain points to try to sell their quick fix I really truly believe that there's a paradigm shift away from that. I think a lot of people are still very easily wrapped up in, in great marketing. Mm -hmm. And of course there's value to that as well. I mean, if you got a great program, you got to tell people about it and you, you got you to gotta share what it is that you have to say. So the question that I always love to ask, and, and it's really important to kind of start the conversation here is, is realizing how often are you stuck in the what? What do I eat? What do I do next? As a business owner, what's the next step? How do I, what's the strategy to launch my program, right? What is, what is the diet that I should be eating? I just mm -hmm. got a message this morning from a beautiful soul on Instagram. She said, Chelsea, I need help. I'm just so confused. I've gone to all these different functional medicine doctors. I've gone to different dietitians. I see these influencers online talking about different things. I don't know what the hell I'm supposed to eat and what I'm not supposed to eat. And that, I, I just, I, I just want to say I'm sorry to everybody who's been totally duped by diet culture, because the question is not what to eat or what not to eat. And there's been great debates and a lot of money, money made by that just one topic itself, what to eat, what not to eat. But really, Billy, the question is, how am I eating and who am I being while I'm eating? Wow. And that's one of the, yeah, it's, it's. It's a really powerful paradigm shift. So not, what am I eating? Like, what if the question was no longer, what do I eat? What do I not to eat? But the question was, who am I being while I am eating? It's, it's a key distinction. And it's, it can even feel a little bit confusing sometimes. Because if you're like, well, who am I being? I'm being me. I don't know. Yes, of course you're being you. But let's dig a little bit deeper into that. And this is getting to that emotional root cause. Because... You know, even my clients who come to me, you know, if they have SIBO, if they have dysbiosis, if they have a parasite, if they have an infection, yes, we have to address that infection. But why did that infection fester in the first place? Well, maybe you have slow gut motility. 
all right, well, is that even a root cause or why do you have slow gut motility? <laughs> so there are, of course, like you said, physiological aspects to this. If you've had food poisoning, if you had a concussion ever in your life, that can be, that can be a trigger to some of these root cause things. But if we really, really dig, you know, the root cause isn't a food sensitivity. The root cause <laughs> might not even be a diagnosis that you've been previously diagnosed. Um, it's probably something else. And that something else is definitely the emotional component to it all, the emotional, physiological, uh, uh, psychological, and spiritual component to it all. And, you know, this is, this is really where the new paradigm of ultimate healing is, is going to. And I think we've come out of a hundred years of the great depression and world wars. And now we are reliving all of those things again and worldwide pandemics and, you know, where our, our nervous systems, I mean, and a lot of great things have come out of those things too, right? You know, the, the industrial revolution and, and technology and the internet, right? It's like, as human beings in the last 100 years, we have just sped up so fast. Very fast. And we have gotten so far away. I mean, in that same time, really, modern medicine was also birthed from the battlefield. And when you look at what modern medicine is, it's really symptom management. You've got a broken bone, you have rashes, here's a cream, you have, you know, and I, I say this because I love modern medicine. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else in the world if I had a trauma or an emergency. But I, when it comes to chronic illness, I believe Western medicine just hasn't quite connected all the dots yet. You go to the eye doctor and the foot doctor and the heart doctor, but it's all connected. Not to mention, then you're going to your therapist and then your health coach, but again, it's all connected. So how do you piece together what this person says versus what that person says, what that person says, this leads to this really confusing paradigm and conundrum. Well, we have to look at the three pieces of us. We are body, mind, and soul. And when we just look at the body, we just look at the toxins that we've been exposed to, and we just look at the mechanical digestion, the chemical digestion, and where things are falling short, we can only address those things so much. If there's an infection, of course, we got to address it. We have to treat it. But if we don't look at the emotional and spiritual components, we're missing the root cause. And so many of us from the last hundred years have experienced so much generational trauma that, you know, from our parents and our grandparents, we learn these really inefficient coping mechanisms to our undesirable emotions. We either sweep them under the rug or we drink them away or, or we just don't talk about them at all. Hush, hush, we don't talk about emotions here. And we just gaslight everyone and pretend, pretend like everything's fine, but we're the big, fat, happy Greek wedding family. Everyone's fine, everyone's happy, we're perfect. Low vibe emotions are not welcome here. These things start to creep into our subconscious mind. And then what happens is our lizard brain, our primal brain, our survival brain says, oh my God, I'm in high alert all the time, which is then being perpetuated by social media and meetings and Zooms and this and that, all the places that we have to be and the kids are crying in the background and the boss is a jerk and I don't even know where my spouse is, right? It's, <laughs> yeah. like, it's, it's perpetuating this constant state of fight or flight. So we're, we're wrapping it up here and bringing it all back around. When we are in a state of fight or flight, digestion is the first system to shut down, literally. literally. We get dry mouth, cotton mouth, no hydrochloric acid is produced in the stomach. No peristalsis and migrating motor complex is happening any, anymore. Your vagus nerve is talking to your brain saying, alert, 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 alert. No blood is flowing to the intestines. It's all going to our limbs to run really fast. And we're not running fast. We're sitting and we're festering and we're scrolling in all the stress. It's, it's like causing me to... Yes. <sighs> that right there is the response that we're always living in. This is a huge emotional root cause. Now, when we talk about the broad umbrella of emotional root cause, at least when I talk about it, it's 
nervous system regulation. I love that phrase. When you are not in a state of parasympathetic central nervous response, affectionately known as rest and digest, which we don't learn about that one in school. We learn about sympathetic fight or flight all the time. It's easy to understand that one because we're yeah. always living there. But to get to a point where we're actually down shifting and now creating a new baseline of health that's down here in rest and digest, it's life-changing. And of course, our own emotional triggers are all extremely individual. However, the strategy behind healing it is pretty much the same. And a lot of that has to do with looking at what happened with curiosity and not judgment in a safe space, whether you're you know, alone or reading a book or doing self-development practices and journaling, or you're, that space is being held by a professional, which you know, depending on where you're at in your journey and the degree of trauma you've experienced, I highly recommend asking for help. And noticing and understanding when you are responding to life in the same manner that your brain had to respond to that trauma in the past. And remember, trauma is a spectrum from big T to little t. It could have been your second birthday, a balloon popped really loud and it scared you. And then for the rest of your life, you're super jittery at anything. The drop of a pin could mm -hmm. even elicit that response. So becoming self-aware and saying, oh, okay, with curiosity and not judgment, this is super important because the lizard brain is always going to run back under the rock. If the lizard brain perceives threat, the lizard's never going to crawl out from under the mm -hmm. rock and lay and bask in the sun on top, which is the end goal, right? You have to feel safe. You got to feel curious. You got to bring compassion to your situation. You got to understand that at some point in your life, you experienced trauma and that's okay. That could have been your mom didn't listen to you one time when you were a kid and you process that as trauma all the way, of course, to more dramatic scenarios. And at that point, your brain learned some strategy for survival, some coping mechanism for survival in that moment. You're still operating in that same way, even though it's self is sabotaging you, it's keeping you from your goals, it's keeping you stuck, and it's not the most efficient way to cope anymore. So looking at emotional root cause is a multidimensional process, but the overall umbrella is nervous system regulation and learning how to downshift from a trauma response, fight or flight, into rest and digest. At that point, we can start turning digestion back on. And we can life hack our way through it too. We can supplement, we can put bitters on our tongue to get our mouth salivating. We can do all those things to jumpstart it. But the long-term goal is to not have to do those things anymore. We're, we're retraining our body to work efficiently with our brain. And there's, there's tools as well that you can explore, you know, EMDR, um, PS Tech is another one. These are all more kind of therapy-based things. And again, depending on where you're at in your journey, um, you could reach out to me and ask. I have, lot, I have a lot of people who specialize in a lot of different things to help people depending on where they're at in their journey. <laughs> yeah, you, you need a whole arsenal of different tools because there's not one, um, there's not one tool for every every problem you you need a unique thing you can't if you if all you've got a ham is a hammer everything looks like a nail you need a very specific tool for a very specific problem and different types and the cool of thing about that is that you you get to shiny up your tools you get to throw yeah. away the rusty ones you get to build a whole new toolbox and that doesn't have to feel overwhelming you can start with just a new hammer and, and then it can, it can be fun go, yeah it's super fun <laughs> yeah it really can mm -hmm. And that's just the process. Uh, but when you actually begin to reap the benefits too. So what can somebody expect if they move from being in a very dysregulated nervous system state to being more regulated? What, what do you usually see there? The coolest moment is when a client comes to me and they say, Chelsea, something magical happened this week. This scenario played out and I had control over my reaction." or I, I was no longer feeling triggered, or I was triggered, 
But instead of doing the old thing that I've always done, I tried something different. So you notice how it, it has nothing to do even with like the end result, but it's this moment of, I actually do have the power because what happens when we, we live in this trauma brain, we feel scarcity mindset all the time. We're always a victim. Anything that happens in our lives, anything that anyone does or says is to us. And a really big paradigm shift that I would offer anyone to try on for size is that life is happening for you and it's happening to teach you something. And, you know, all of the tough times in your life are opportunities to reflect back and grow and look at and say, yeah, man, that was a pretty crappy situation, but I came out of it on the other side. I'm, I'm breathing and alive today, whether or not I'm well really kind of is the next question. And who do I need to ask for help to get me there? But Really, it's, it's the opportunity to witness our own power. And then from that place, of course, there's a lot of logistics to it. And when it comes to gut health, I mean, what you can expect to happen is enjoying food again and not feeling bloated and actually having pleasant bowel movements every day. And mm -hmm. if you're not going every single day, then you need to call me right now. <laughs> and, you know, it's amazing how many people don't realize that they're supposed to have a bowel movement every single day. Oh, I've yeah. gone three days pretty much my whole life without ever going. Oh, boy. It's a big red flag. <laughs> yes, red flag. And again, it's not judgment. So if you come to me and say, I'm chronically constipated, it's like, cool, let's explore. Like, let's get in the mud together. And that's, you know, another opportunity that may be on the journey to healing for you is that you get to do this in a way that's fun and with help. And if, if you're ever in a situation where you're working with a professional and they think that they know you better than you know you, it's time to run the other way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I will always say to my clients, you know your body best. I'm just here to help you kind of navigate the muddy waters and to look at, to open the menu of options. You get to pick the options from the menu, but I'm here to provide a lot of options and to dance with you in the mud and to get down and roll around in there with you and to kind of be um, exploratory in the journey. So, uh, you know, another, another thing you get to look forward to is just feeling childlike again, right? Imagine, imagine what life was like when we were kids before we, let the opinions of others get to us or before we started feeling sick and in pain or before the world and all of its responsibilities and stresses started changing or before that one moment in your life that changed everything for you. Um, you know, there, there was a, there's a lot of, you know, children are interested in the world, in learning about the world and learning about themselves and learning about each other. They're always curious. So, you know, on the path to healing, whether that's physically healing gut health, which if you're listening to this, you probably could benefit from a, a bit of that as well. Um, and all the beautiful layers that come with it, you, you get to be curious again. And so many of my clients come to me and they just, you know, their aura has been dulled a bit, you know, they've lost that spark in life. And when that starts to get shiny again, and they start to show up feeling like, wow, I'm actually feeling good and I'm doing the work and it's fun and it's easy. And I no longer believe that I have to deprive myself or restrict myself of the things that I love in life to enjoy it or feel good. That's what you get to look forward to. <laughs> I think that's, that's huge because I think at some point in our, in our development, we sort of, maybe some people tell us life's hard and that that's just how it is. And there's this constant niggling. that's just like, actually, I kind of don't believe that. And what you're saying is, is true. You can get to a point where not only is life not hard, it's actually easy, it's enjoyable, and it's actually happening for you. It's like the universe is conspiring to give you the best life possible. Yes. Have you read any Paolo Coelho? I, oh, I read the, I, I have, I, I read the, the, the Alchemist, is it? Yes. 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 I've read that one. That one. I listened to it as an audio book. Very, yeah. very soothing for the nervous system to listen to it as an audio book. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That was a really easy read. And if you're looking for some place fun to start, that's a fiction story that has a lot of really nugget, great nuggets mm -hmm. in it. I think that's one of them in that book. Well, mm -hmm. it's, it was either that one or the, or another one, but truly the universe is always conspiring to help you. And, and there's always strings being pulled in the background 
for your benefit. And if, if you hear that and you feel reactory or if you feel like, yeah, right. Or if you feel like, you know, what the hell is this woman talking about? Or, you know, if there's a piece of you that's like, I don't believe that at all, then that might be a sign that there's some self-reflection and healing that needs to be done. Because if you don't even believe that it's possible for you to feel good and to live a pleasant, joyful life, even despite all the chaos that is out there, well, then you're never going to experience it. And what's worth than, worse than that? And looking back on your life and I always go here, like, let's, let's get a little deep. Like, let's, let's talk about the deathbed theory. What, what are you going to do on your deathbed when you look back? And if you've never read the, um, there's a book called Lessons, Lessons from the Dying. A, a hospice nurse wrote it. I've heard of that. Yeah, I can't, I don't think that's the exact title right now. I'm butchering it, but I've it's like top five, top five lessons from the dying. And, and one of the, like the number one, oh, regrets of the dying. That's what it is. Regrets of the dying. The number one regret that this hospice nurse found was that people regretted not living the life that they wanted to live, but they lived life on somebody else's terms. I mean, that's, that has nothing to do with like, oh, I regret not, I don't know, hitting goals. I regret not, you know, it, it's, it's much deeper than that. I regret not just living the life that I wanted to live, whatever that looked like. So what do you think stops people from living that life that they want to live? What holds them back? Because if it was, if it was easy, surely everyone would do it. So what's stopping them? Safety, love, and acceptance is exactly it. So the human brain, our heart, our soul needs these three things, the three primary needs of every single human, to be safe, to be loved, and to be accepted by their peers, their families, by their coworkers, and everybody around. And if there's ever a time in your life that you're experiencing self-sabotage or you're not living a life that you want to live, is because one of these th three things feels threatened, mm -hmm. whether it's lo logical or not. So we can categorize the opinions of others into the acceptance category. Oh, but you know, if the opinions of others are what's holding me back, well, that's because you feel like their opinions mean that they don't love and accept you. You don't feel safe anymore in receiving somebody else's opinion, which is probably also a trauma response. <laughs> yes. But truly, if, if, you, if you're not living the life you want to live, it's because somewhere deep inside of you, or maybe not so deep, maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's right on the surface, you don't feel safe, you don't feel loved, or you don't feel accepted. And, and one kind of really easy example to this is, Say you're trying to stop drinking alcohol, but every single day your coworkers go to happy hour. That's, that's a bit of a conundrum. So the life that you want to live is sober, but you believe that if you become sober, your coworkers will no longer accept you. And if you've got an abandonment trauma, as you, as you mentioned, that's feeding right into that, isn't it? Which most of us do. Yeah. Most of us do. So... A question that I have, because I think that you could probably relate to this just as much as I, but if you've, if you've been through a stage in your life where you haven't felt loved, understood and accepted, you, you kind of don't know what that feels like. So if somebody's listening and they're in that state where they don't even know what it feels like to be loved, understood and accepted, how do they, how do they even know that this is them? Mm, good question. I want to make sure I'm hearing the question properly. Mm -hmm. Are you saying if someone's listening and they never in their life have felt safe loved mm -hmm. or accepted mm -hmm. so they don't even know what it could be mm -hmm. like so they've they're you always living in a state of fight or flight fear yes or it's like they or, don't know what they're missing yeah. yeah i see what you're saying well is there something in your life that you desire that you're not taking action on simple as that yeah, yeah. and if the answer is yes then they're missing one of those three so that's probably almost universally everyone. Yep. <laughs> and, and even people that are working on this already and are to some degree aware that they're missing one of these three, they're probably still a, a yes to this. Yeah. Yeah. So, and there's layers to it. There's always going to be layers to it, right? There's, there's 
even once we get to a point where we feel like we've healed or we can still, when, even when we're taking messy action, right? This is one of my favorite terms. Messy action. Messy action. You don't need to believe in yourself in order to take action. You just got to take messy action. And until you start taking messy action, you'll never believe in yourself because you don't have any proof of the results mm -hmm. until you start taking action. So if, if there's something that you desire, I'm sorry, if there's something that you desire in your life and you're not taking action, ask yourself why. And, and where might those limiting beliefs have come from? I don't believe it's possible for me. I believe it's going to be really hard. I believe I'm going to have to sacrifice something in order to get what I want. I believe um, it's, it's usually one of those things, to mm -hmm. be honest. Either it's not possible or it's going to be really hard or someone's going to have an opinion about it. And that feels really scary. Um, I got a little bit distracted. What was the original question? So I think you answered it quite nicely. It was, it was okay. in essence, how would somebody know if they're missing one of these three very important or requirements of, 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 of being, how would they, how would they know if they've never yeah. actually experienced it before? Because yeah. you could probably relate like me before actually experiencing what safety and love and understanding and acceptance actually feels like you're like, wow, I didn't even know that I was missing all of that. That was just what I thought yeah. life was. Yes, 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 exactly. The, the beautiful thing, Billy, about all of this work is that it starts with one little aha moment mm -hmm. or one little light bulb. What it was yours? Even Could I ask? Sorry. What was yours? Oh, what was mine? Oh, shit. It's like there's so many layers. It, yeah, well, and what I was going to say was once one light bulb turns on, mm -hmm. It can never turn back off. Once something is seen, okay. it can be unseen. So once you start going down the path of this light bulb turned on, now the next one's going to turn on. Now the next one's going to turn on. So, you know, it's sort of been, and, and as we heal body, mind, and soul, there's also different layers to that. So my first aha moment, you know, this, this must be more than just rashes on my skin. Mm -hmm. Oh, maybe it has to do with my gut. Aha. Mm. I have food sensitivities. Aha. Uh -huh. I have to heal my gut. There's inflammation. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. What's the root cause of that? Now that I've eliminated all these things, I can reintroduce them back in. Oh, maybe you hear something, you listen to something or some, you know, somehow God puts something in your life where you A podcast like this, maybe someone <laughs> says the word sentiment and you're like, that resonates. I had never heard that phrase before. And I, I had a degree at this point, I had a degree in psychology and had never connected abandonment issues as a piece of my story, which was, it, it is the story, <laughs> yeah. which just goes to show you how disassociated we can all be when yeah. we're in survival mode. And also was why I had no memories for so many years of my life because I was so disassociated from what was actually happening that you know it's 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 allowing those synchronistic moments to drop into your life and to follow follow the breadcrumbs right these are all kind of phrases that i've said over the years like you have to heed the omens you got to look for the synchronistic moments in your life and if something catches your interest if it's a word or a person or a phrase there's probably an aha moment there and the more aha moments you have, the more light bulb moments you have, the more you will be guided down a path of where you might want to explore next on your healing journey. I personally love starting with the body, right? It was my yoga story. It was my gut health story. I think there's a lot of value in starting in the body because it's, I would what, agree. We yeah, it's what we see, touch, taste, feel, and hear. It's our physical experience of ourselves in the world. And if we're waking up every day in pain, how am I supposed to do the mindset work if I'm worried about having to run to the bathroom halfway through a podcast recording? Like, that's not ideal. <laughs> it's quite embarrassing. And then here I go down again, the shame spiral and the safe, loved, and accepted. What will people think of me if I go out to dinner and I have to leave halfway through because I have a bout of IBS? Or what will people think of me if I have to be super restricted at this dinner, right? This plays into everything. 
starting with the body gives us the energy, the power and the excitement to keep digging more mm-hmm. and to let more of those light bulb moments start to turn on. I, I think that's, that's very interesting that you start with the body because it's exactly where I start too. And I yes. find it's, it's very difficult to, I mean, if you imagine the, the weight of, of abandonment trauma, it's not something that you're going to tap on, tap into very easily. If you're malnourished and you're exposed to toxins and you're not in a physically like good air, like a physically safe environment. So yeah. working on the body is really good because it sets a nice foundation for us to then go in and work on these these deeper yes. things where the actual issues are but we need a good foundation first so absolutely uh, an interesting similarity to our to our approaches i also find the the physical the body no one disputes it you can talk about the emotional root causes of things people are like oh i'm a bit hesitant maybe i don't believe that trauma what's that i've had a good childhood maybe they've disassociated from it they don't even remember it but nobody disputes the physical because you're in a physical body and you have physical pain and you you can't argue with that. It's there. So I think it's a really good place to start. I I would agree. Absolutely. And the beauty about that is once we support the body, we've learned that, you know, over 95% of serotonin is actually produced in our gut. So when we heal our gut, now our brain is starting to tune into more of these happy feeling neurotransmitters, serotonin, dopamine, GABA, where, you know, the previous... I would say almost old paradigm. And again, there's a disclaimer here. If you're dealing with depression, bless that medicine, those SSRIs, those, you know, the things that are helping you get out of bed every day, bless that medicine. And wouldn't it be cool if we could support ourselves in more ways than one? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be cool to be able to say, oh, actually, if I also focus on my gut health, serotonin, GABA, and dopamine are going to start to skyrocket naturally. I'm going to actually start feeling better without having to rely on external sources. How cool is that? Again, now we can start taking our power back. Now we're not relying on other people and other things to make us feel good, but it's literally coming from our gut. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of something one of my clients said recently is she's struggling with some histamine problems and is on an antihistamine currently. And she feels like the progress she's making like isn't real because she's she's medicating and i said you have to change how you're looking at that because not only is it not hurting you it's actually helping you it's it's a tool that you're using to facilitate all of these other achievements that you're getting it's not it's not opposed to this it's because of this it's it's serving you it's one of the many tools in the toolbox exactly Exactly. bless those tools bless that medicine and i think this is such an important you know aspect to this conversation billy because so many of us feel guilt for having to take medicine at one point. And I, and I think that really roots back down to the belief that we have to do it all by ourselves, right? Mm-hmm. Our ego yeah. wants to think that we can do it all by ourselves. That's been perpetuated by a high-performing society that we live in that tells us that we can do it all and be it all and that we have to do it all and be it all by ourselves. And that if we ask for help, then we're weak. Or if we cry, then we're, we're vulnerable and we're going we're gonna to die. <laughs> you know, it's like our weak spots. Ultimately, I think asking for help and, and medicating to getting ourselves to a point where we can mentally, physically, emotionally be able to explore other means and routes is the best it's the best of both worlds that's so why it's, cool. like, it's so amazing it's like again why are we going to all these different doctors can't we all come together it's like east meets west in such a beautiful way can't we use all of these tools at our disposal to support our our health and well-being yes yes we can but like anything else billy doesn't matter what it is that i'm consuming the question is how am I consuming this thing? What do I eat? What do I not eat? What medicine, medicine do I take? What do I not take? It doesn't matter if you're not believing that that thing is going to help you. Mm-hmm. Or if you are really rejecting that medicine in your heart and soul, but you're just forcing yourself to take it, is it going to help you in the long term? It's like when people say to me, oh, I eat super healthy, but I still don't feel good. It's like, well, I don't really care what you're eating, but how do you eat? Oh, well, I eat in the car on the way to work and then I eat the leftovers of my kids' scraps and I, I eat, <laughs> oh, but then, at, you know, but then at the end of the night, I have a small piece of salmon. I'm like, 
All right. So who you're being is super distracted and, and super high performing, which I don't mean this in a negative way. It's just self-awareness, mm -hmm. right? How you're eating is not super present. It's not a sensual experience. It's not a sacred act of self-care. It's just something that you have to do. It's one more thing on your to-do list that you're trying to check off for the day. Same thing with medicine. It's like, unless we shift our energy and receive the gift of that thing, whether it be food or medicine, it's probably going to fall short. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I really couldn't agree with you more. I think that's, it's very, it's very profound, maybe, maybe, maybe a bit too profound. I think that even a, a couple of months back wouldn't have been something I would be able to digest. So maybe it's, it's, it's Maybe it's that spark that's going to inspire some people to, to think maybe it's not just the food, it's, it's how I feel around eating it. One thing that, that I looked into recently and really helped facilitate a huge breakthrough for me was uh, an eating disorder called ARFID. I don't know if you've heard of that, if you're familiar with that. Yeah. It's really interesting. It's, it's short for, it's a, it stands for Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder. And it's all around avoiding foods for fear of negative consequences. And this can even express as the fear of the physical sensations or the, the consequences of having these foods. Yes. And I, I, I facilitate a huge breakthrough myself by really sitting down and becoming aware of like who I was while I was eating. What was I feeling? What was happening? What was I making this mean? And once I, once I cleared all of this and I, I had a, a huge trauma release, it was really a really amazing experience. I sat down and I ate ice cream like broke all the rules. I broke the histamine rule. I broke the carbs rule. I broke the dairy, the casing, the gluten. Rule, all, yeah, the rules. all of them. I broke every single rule. And that's the way it had to be because I knew that I had to just throw the whole thing out. Yeah. And it was, it was like, that's what my body was asking me for. And that's what I had. And from that point, this was, this was for me, this was the huge light bulb. It's like, I've, I've, I've had so many light bulbs coming up to that. Yeah. The little one, the little one that got me started. The first one that got me started, your body is self-healing and self-regulating. I was like, if it's, if it can heal a car, it can heal everything. Why is it not fixing it? So it made me keep looking, looking and looking. And then I had this huge breakthrough where I was able to eat wherever I want without, initially there was fear of the negative consequences, but it wasn't the negative consequence that was so bad. It was what I made the negative consequences mean. And as soon as I blasted that apart, I could basically eat wherever I want and no physical symptom, no physical yeah. reaction at all. And it was just like, after that point, it was like, you can't go back. And I think that's yeah. a, a huge thing that really help people understand is you, you never, you never go back. You never like lose progress. If you have a flare up, if something bad happens, you are never going to go back. It just doesn't happen. You're not going backwards. It, it, yeah. you, you can't. It's, it's impossible. I got this. I think you'll really love this. I got this really cool experience where I felt my heart chakra as this cog that was turning and it's, and it's like, it turns in one direction. It doesn't turn back doesn't matter if you try to make it go faster. It doesn't matter if you try to make it go slower. It just keeps turning. And it's like, you can't do wrong. You, you can't, you can't go wrong. You can't, you can't go back. Everything is going exactly as it's supposed to be. You're exactly where you're supposed to be. And the universe is conspiring. Your body is conspiring. Like there's so much happening to just bring you your next highest level of health. And you just yes. have to be able to take a step back and just look at, look at how far you've come, no matter where you are, even if you're at the beginning. Some people get stuck in the model of my body's broken and they just accept that. So if you're even open to the possibility that there might be something that you can do to improve it, yeah. like you're, you're already, that's your first light bulb. You're already there. I love this, Billy. And thank you for breaking it down like that. Cause I think, I think I've been in this world for so long that sometimes I'm like, what were the big light bulb mm. moments? But you're right. It's like, it's that moment that someone said the word abandonment and that was mm -hmm. like, holy crap. Okay. This isn't about just my body, right? It's like, there's so much more to it. And look, by throwing away all the rules, and this is something I work with on all my, with all my clients, like, because many who, by the time they come to me, they're on a super restricted diet. They've avoided all these foods for fear of the negative consequences of them. If I eat this, I'm going to be in pain. We, we, we always are going to avoid pain, right? If we're feeling pain, we're not safe. There it is again. Right? Yeah. If we're feeling pain, we're not safe. And you're exactly right by starting to explore what am I making this mean about me? If I'm in pain, it means I'm a bad person. If I, you know, if, 
if I have a flare up, it means that I'm a failure at life. Oh, wow. Is that actually true? Hell no. Hell no. I mean, did you know that you can literally, if you, you can chop off the top of your lung and it'll regenerate just like the liver, you can cut your liver in half and it'll regenerate. Like we are literally regenerating human beings. It's freaking awesome. <laughs> <sighs> it's like the, the oldest part of your whole body is your, your big bones and your hips. They're seven to 10 years old. Everything else is younger than that. Even if you're 80 years old, the oldest part of your body is 10 years old. Like that. And wow. even like your, so gut health especially gut lining like yes. four four to 12 days old like you can yes. have a new gut in four to 12 days so literally you it's can regenerate. program is only is only 14 days long so i'm like we can that's literally what you need. <laughs> that's all we need it's like so eye-opening i mean then obviously that's that's the body that's where it starts and then after that we we have the opportunity mm -hmm. to dig deeper and to look at the the spiritual and emotional aspects of it and that's that's where it gets to be cool. That's where it gets to be cool. So I think this gives us a really nice avenue to talk about your services. So yeah, cool. it's really, really interesting you bring up abandonment and you can see how being stuck in an abandonment pattern makes it yeah. really difficult to ask people for help. So yeah. if someone has a gut feeling, maybe there's, maybe they got screaming at them. We need, we need help. How is it that somebody could reach out to contact you to find out more information about how they can get, get the help from you? How could they, how could they do that? Definitely. And thank you for offering that invitation to share. So definitely, first and foremost, come find me on Instagram, Chelsea Haynes Coaching. I'm on there on the daily. I'm currently sharing. Um, I'm in launch mode. So I have opened my spring gut health reset program. If you don't have Instagram, go to my website, chelseahainescoaching.com. You can send me an email right from the website. That's also where all the links are to all of my things. I love a one-stop shop. It's like my favorite thing in the world. And this, this is also testimony to my programs that like we find easy buttons. That's what it's all about. Like you deserve the process to be easy. And it's the same thing with the buying process. So come find me either on Instagram or on my website, send me a direct email. It's me back here responding to emails, book a call with me um, and, and check out my spring program. I mean, this is my gut health reset program is where I started, you know, I talked about in 2009, when I hired my first health coach, we did an inflammatory elimination protocol. And this is just that healing container. And, and it's so great that you mentioned this avoidant food disorder. I'm going to look that up. Off it. For it. Yes. Thank you. Because it's, it's so relevant. And actually I, I love that. I didn't even know that term, but all of my programs are surrounded around the awareness. Yeah. It's a very real thing for all of my clients. So breaking food rules, approaching this program, knowing that in 14 days, I can literally turn over my gut cells and have a brand new gut in, a, in such little time that it is super exciting. And it's really just about creating an intentional healing container. So the whole program is 28 days because we spend a whole week preparing for it. It's super exciting. 14 days, we do an inflammatory healing protocol, and then we get to reintroduce on the, the foods on the other side. So again, you and I talked about this before we started recording, restriction is not at all meant to be forever. So if you're on low FODMAP or if you're on some specialized diet, yes, I'm sure you've gotten short-term results, maybe even somewhat long-term results, but our microbiome needs diversity. And if you're eliminating nutrient-dense foods because of allergies, histamines, all the different things, like let's look at why that might be happening because you're missing out on a lot of goodness of life. If you're eliminating fruit because of the sugar or you're eliminating starches, whatever, whatever it may be, who, who doesn't love potatoes, right? <laughs> so yes, Instagram, Chelsea Haynes coaching. I'm also on LinkedIn, Chelsea Haynes and my website, chelseahainescoaching.com. You can send me an email or a DM. I answer them all day long. Awesome. I'll leave uh, text with links and all the emails and all the information in the little the little thingy below so if you want any of that just make sure you go down there so I like to ask everybody that comes on a couple of questions before we finish up so first question for you what would you suggest that almost anybody can do this is a universally applicable thing that will help literally just about anyone that is very cost effective or preferably free that they can do literally right now to begin to move them towards a higher level of health deep belly breathing deep belly breathing. Right okay 
Yeah, I need it because yeah. I'm in a bit of a bit of a fight or flight state, to be honest. Let's do it. So if you're brand new to belly breathing, this can feel really counterintuitive. So I recommend laying flat on your belly, excuse me, laying flat on your back and place your hands on your belly. Most of us breathe in the top one third of our lungs. We call it chest breathing. Your shoulders going up, right? Shoulders and chest go up and down and we're only breathing up here. And this is also perpetuated by diet culture, both men and women, right? Perky boobs, big chest, thin waist, like mm -hmm. tuck it all in, breathe up here. So we're constantly puffing up our chest, which by the way, what do animals do in nature when they're trying to be threatening? They do yep. the same thing, <laughs> they up their chests. It's like, okay, we're gonna bring the breath down. Diaphragmatic breathing or belly breathing is lower. And the cool, the cool thing about this breathing is that if you think about where your belly is, it's right below your diaphragm, you're going to literally start getting your belly pumping. So your core muscles are going to start helping you turn digestion on before you even eat, which is super important. So if you place your hands on your belly, what you're going to do is just simply relax your shoulders a little bit, relax your face a little bit, and then breathe in through your nose. But as you do, Fill your belly up like a balloon. So push your belly out as you breathe in. And as you exhale, let your belly fall. So again, if you're laying on your back, maybe on your bed or on your floor, it can be even easier because as you look down, when you breathe in, your belly is going to rise. So again, relax your shoulders. Inhale, let your belly rise. Relax your jaw, slow, long, exhale through the mouth. Let your belly fall. Yeah. One more, soften a little bit, relax your bum, relax your shoulders. Deep breath in, the belly fills up like a balloon. You may feel it expand into your chest, that's okay. And then as you exhale, let the belly fall. Mm. Wonderful. <laughs> so good. Call this the backdoor trick to the parasympathetic response. Yes. yes. Diaphragmatic breathing, especially when you exhale and kind of create that I was sound. about to say that. Yep. You're <laughs> stimulating your vagus nerve, which is also a whole, we could do a whole podcast about the vagus nerve. But if you imagine it's like the treasure chest, it is literally the key to unlock rest and digest, turn digestion on, and to feel more relaxed throughout your day. Forget all the science of it. There's a lot of science behind it. We can talk about that if that's helpful. We can do some research, check out my Instagram. I talk about it a lot. But if you only remember this one thing, stop, drop, and belly breathe, you can do it while you're driving. You can even do it in a meeting. Yeah. I'm doing meeting. it now. Nobody will know. And especially as a host on a podcast, you'll notice, and when I'm holding coaching calls, when you're holding space for someone, so if you're a healer, this is a really important, good grounding breath to just. It shifts the energy of yourself and therefore everybody around you. So yes. for a lot of reasons, this free tool is game changing and it takes practice. Many people who, are, who have never done it before it may take some time mm -hmm. to learn it. I've had friends be like, I just don't get it because yes. we're very much in our head. So again, laying on the back, putting your hands on your belly. And even if you don't get it, it doesn't matter. Just keep practicing. Watch your belly rise as you inhale and your belly fall as you exhale and just keep practicing. Very simple. I really love it. It's a really great actionable tip. So my next question would be, if you were... You stepped into the elevator and you found you just happened upon the the president of your country or a very influential public figure that can have a strong say in what happens with like modern medicine and the direction that the medical field goes what what would you tell them you've got 30 seconds to try and influence them for the positive they're receptive so you can say anything you want what would you tell them ban commercials on pharmaceutical medication <laughs> period yeah. Stop putting commercials on the TV for prescription medication because we go to our doctors demanding certain medicine that might not be great for us. And, and we're only doing it because a, a 60 second commercial 
hit all of our pain points. Same with over-the-counter medications. So Tums, antacids, all the things related to gut health, which by the way, if you're taking those, please stop, please stop. But if you're relying on them, <laughs> let's yeah. stop together because it's a, it's a long process, but stop funding commercials on TV for medication, period. Over uh, and over and over again. Ban it, make it illegal. It's not okay. And most of the information that you're hearing in those commercials is wrong anyway. So that yeah. would be my, my number one thing. Yeah. You've got to think it's a commercial. It's for profit. It might yeah. not have your best interests at heart. So exactly. And pay uh, attention when you're whispering and talking really fast of all the side effects. <laughs> yeah. Again, bless the medicine if that is what is best for you based on the conversation that's intimate and private between you and your doctor, not based on what a commercial broadcasts to the nation yes yes great i love it well it has been absolutely lovely having you today chelsea i think you've given my audience some 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 bones to chew there's a lot to think on there's a lot to apply some belly breathing so everybody can do it a little bit a little bit calmer um but i've really loved having you on i'm sure i'm i'm going to invite you on again this has been fantastic and thank you thank you so much for coming i really appreciate it thanks for everything you do Oh, Billy, thanks for holding such a beautiful space. And yes, this, like I said, I've been walking this walk for a really long time. So thank you for letting me like get really big about this conversation. And, uh, you know, it's important to remember that what I do is um, really nitty gritty and small, and that's how we make it sustainable and easy. So it's very, you know, it's small hinges that swing really big doors. So if this, wow. yeah, the small hinges, real big doors, right? It's like, the tiny, tiny little 1% shifts are what we focus on and celebrating those small wins, just like what you said, Billy, along the way for long lasting, um, true long-term healing and, and really needle moving in our health and well-being. So thanks for letting me hold the big space. Don't feel overwhelmed by it. We break it down into digestible chunks <laughs> together. <laughs> I love the metaphor. That's what I oh. use myself. <laughs> yes, always, always. Thank you so much, Chelsea. We'll have you on again soon, okay? Thank you. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Holistic Healing Collective with William Dickinson. Our passion is to heal with energy, holistic, and plant medicine using a science-based blend of mind, body, and spirit. We hope you've enjoyed the show, and we hope you've gotten some useful and practical information. Make sure to like, rate, and review, and tell a friend or two. We'll be back soon. But in the meantime, find us on Facebook at the Holistic Healing Collective Podcast and support group. We'd love to see you. Take care, be well, and see you next time on the Holistic Healing Collective.